Travis Burling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at LAM Research with David Freed. I'm going to talk today about virtual twins. David, we've been hearing about virtual twins or digital twins for years. What are they and where are they starting to gain traction? Okay, uh, virtual twins or digital twins, uh, people are kind of throwing those terms around a lot lately. Uh, we tend to think more about virtual twins. In, in our view, a, a digital twin is maybe just data and a data model to predict something, but a virtual twin has some, has some governing function to it, maybe some overlying uh, physical constraints or physical phenomena built into it, maybe calibrated or validated with data, uh, but some combination of the two in a virtual twin. Let's take a closer look. Sure. David, what are we looking at? Okay, so uh, one of the things I talk about a lot is how a real virtual twin often has multiple layers to it. Uh, definitely a virtual twin of any complex system. You want to have multiple layers to it. There's not one virtual twin for the whole thing. So I often think of like, if I were to make a virtual twin of a city, I have to think about the applications. What am I trying to solve with that virtual twin? If I wanted to try to fly a drone around a city, I really need to understand where the buildings are. And so the virtual twin of the city needs to have the topography of the different buildings. So this might be the virtual twin of the buildings of a city that would help me solve the problem of flying a drone around. However, if I'm trying to drive through the city, that information doesn't matter. What I need to understand is the roads and a map of the roads or highways around that city. It's a totally different set of data and a different data structure to solve a different problem. Uh, and if I was going to maybe take public transportation or subways, it's a different set of data altogether. A subway map versus a street map, there's different data on those, there's different uh, structures to that, and I use it to solve different problems. Now, each one of these could be a layer of exactly the same city, the same virtual twin, but I need to connect these three very different layers and different data structures to one ground truth. The real city is in reality, one city, and the roads and the buildings and the subways are, they all need to connect somehow to that reality. You can't have a road on your street map go through a building in your topography map. So there's got to be some connection between these layers, but they're different for set applications. Basically, you're building a stack of abstractions, right? Absolutely. And, and we have to do the exact same thing for equipment in process equipment in the semiconductor manufacturing ecosystem as well. We could have lots of different layers for very different applications in the fab. So how do the pieces dip really go together? You, you really want to use each piece for a specific function, but you do want to understand the context of this, right? Absolutely. So when I take this analogy and I translate it to equipment in the semiconductor ecosystem, one of these models might be the mechanical virtual twin of a piece of equipment. That's the type of information I need to have if I'm doing an installation or a maintenance operation. I need to know where the bolts are to take a certain panel off. That might come from a mechanical virtual twin. I spend a lot of my time thinking about the process virtual twin. So if I use a certain recipe, what's going to happen to the wafer in that equipment? How are those processes going to come together? There's a lot of complexity there, a lot of physics and chemistry, and those models are very complicated but they have to tie together with the mechanical twin. So if I go and I change a part of the chamber, I change a part of the reactor, it likely has an effect on what process occurs in that reactor. So even though those layers of virtual twin are very different, have different data, different governing equations, you use them to solve different problems, they both have to be connected to the ground truth of reality that is a system that runs a process. So the value of this is the individual layers, but you also need to understand how they go together, right? Because one may affect something else in a different layer. Yeah, I, I think the different disciplines of these different layers, we've spent a, a ton of time and a ton of effort creating high fidelity models or virtual twins at these individual layers to solve specific applications. Um, this has gained significant traction in the industry. This is in use, and, and it's quite popular. Uh, I think we've, we've sort of solved a, the first major class of problems that require individual layers of virtual twins. The challenges that we're, we're coming to now is how to keep these tied together. So when the virtual twin of the mechanical equipment, when somebody uses that, makes a, an equipment change or a, a part change, how does that flow through to the process model and to the reactor model? How do we connect these two? And, and actually, because we've developed them independently, they don't always 
talk to each other really well. So we're starting to learn some lessons about how to interface them, how to keep these things connected. And in the future, we will likely build these digital twin or virtual twin layers with the thought process in mind to keep them connected long term. So that's sort of the phase of development we're in right now where we're, we're really learning to connect these better because we've already learned how to make each one of these layers pretty high fidelity. One of the problems here is that you all these pieces are in such a state of flux all the time. You think about process models, they're going, what, multiple times a year now. Yeah, so I, I think there are other industries that have learned some of these lessons. And I keep going back to the EDA side or the design side of the semiconductor industry has learned this, where they're able to update PDKs and update tech files and keep that in sync with actual technology on a pretty regular basis to keep current and to keep the different layers of, of virtualization connected at all times. So I think other, other parts of our industry and other industries have learned the lessons of connecting these different layers. And I think we have to rely on some of that history, but also innovate within our own space because these are, these are quite complicated at each of these levels. Does this require standards? I think absolutely. I think that's where we're going in the same way the PDKs have, uh, have generated standards. I think there's various different standards bodies in our industry that can help through this. But I think as we develop standards for what these virtual twins are used for, how they're applied in the industry, we can also develop standards for connecting through these layers, uh, connecting to the ground truth reality of equipment. And you're talking about cities here, but you think about this kind of federated learning, which is really what it's about. You're going into, say, for automotive, you're looking at the entire vehicle. How do you design different pieces? How does that affect the whole car? Yeah, I also think about um, airlines and, and um, the aerospace industry where certain companies have become experts at building the engines and maintaining the engines and understanding having predictive models for maintenance of the engines, but they work very closely with the airlines who own those aircraft to do the scheduled maintenance and to collect all the data across multiple airlines that use the same type of engines. So there's, there's all sorts of learning that can be absorbed from other industries to see how do we connect data learning and models from these different layers of virtual twins and put them together. Uh, banking is another industry where this has gotten quite interesting. Uh, they're all using each other's data to do fraud prevention and things like that. How do we do that type of federated learning or secure compute where we're able to pass learning knowledge and application value from these different layers to a connected application set at our customers? These are massive simulations, right? Uh, it depends. Some of these layers are, are quite simple. I, I don't mean to, to, to oversimplify things, but a, you know, a mechanical or topography uh, view of a piece of equipment or a city might be very simple. It's just geometry. But the uh, process layer, you know, what type of chemistry and physics and you know, the plasma that's going on inside one of our reactors, that can be incredibly complex, incredibly data and compute heavy. And so these different layers of a virtual twin are wildly different in terms of their complexity, the technology, the compute requirements, and, and that's one of the biggest challenges with connecting them. And also the kind of data that you're collecting too, right? Absolutely, they, they, they'll definitely feed on different data streams. The, the process virtual twin will feed on process results and metrology data, whereas the mechanical virtual twin might feed on parts inventory and staging data, things like that. So there's different data streams in and data streams out. One of the really interesting layers at the equipment level right now is what we call the sustainability virtual twin. So we're looking at an entire system in a fab environment and trying to understand the sustainability impacts, both from uh, power, um, gas consumption, but also exhaust and effluent production. And so there's a whole different set of data and different set of problems, different set of models to solve the sustainability challenges in our industry. And so that's a whole nother layer of an equipment virtual twin. And you've got all these potential overlays too. You've got things like, okay, is, what happens in terms of aging of this particular piece of equipment, right? What's the mechanical stress here? Right, so there's all these different concerns. There, we could come up with a million of them. But when we have the virtualization for any of these layers, we can start to understand trade-offs. So you may be able to make trade-offs that are better for a process parameter or better for throughput but at the expense of sustainability, and maybe you don't want to make that decision. Maybe you don't want to make that trade-off and you opt for one versus the other. It's very, very difficult to make those decisions and those trade-offs before you have the equipment if you don't have this type of virtualization in place.
As you do this, you're really crossing engineering disciplines too though, right? Will this break down some of the traditional silos that really have not kept pace with some of the changes that we've seen? Absolutely. I mean, this allows us to connect across, you know, mechanical and process and electrical and all the different disciplines that are required in this industry. So it definitely allows us to connect and, as I was saying, make certain trade-offs across those different spaces that we've really struggled to make previously. Um, this type of virtualization and these capabilities are really what's key to unlocking the potential of all our, our engineering teams. Uh, we've done certain studies where we, we compete you know, our engineers alone versus our engineers with these capabilities and with these virtual twins. And these virtual twins are proven now to significantly accelerate the capabilities of our engineers to develop some of these problems or to solve some of these problems. Uh, the breadth and complexity of the problem set in our industry is exploding. And so if we're going to solve these challenges, uh, we're going to need a lot more engineers, but we're going to need to make all of our engineers much more efficient to solve those problems. And this type of virtualization is really our key to that. As we go forward, then the future of the fabs with demand increasing so significantly, future fabs are going to be much more autonomous. We're, we're on a path towards the lights out fab or the autonomous fab. And these types of models and these virtualizations in place are really the key to getting to the lights out fab. Uh, but they're always done sort of in collaboration between human and machine. One great example right now is our new cobots that we're deploying into fabs where we have uh, robots, robotic entities with a lot of these models and, and governing uh, compute power working in concert with humans to improve the uh, effectiveness and efficiency of different maintenance operations on our equipment. You're taking the learnings from each step of this and actually using it again versus losing it, right? Absolutely. Because these virtual twins sort of, they continue to digest uh, additional data, additional capability and, and technology, uh, they, they don't die. We don't put them on the shelf and move on to the next one. They continue to evolve and become more useful over time. David Free, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate it.